morning. Welcome to Living Faith Christian Church. We're glad you're with us. Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord together. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a Thank 
Cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every life. I worship you. I worship you. You are here.
Amen. We serve the way maker, promise keeper, miracle worker. That's who we worship today. It is great. We are so excited. I want to say Happy New Year to all of you. We made it to 2021. Amen. Huh? How about that? Here we are. It's 2021. And I see that a bunch of you have already checked off one of your resolutions to attend church more in 2021. So good job if you're online or in here. So congratulations. We want to welcome you. And I want to say a special welcome. If this is your first time checking us out here at Living Faith, we are so glad to have you. And thanks for making us a part of your day. Well, today we finish and wrap up our Rediscover Christmas series, and it's called Finding Love in Our Differences. And Pastor Mark will be in John, uh, 1 John chapter 4, so you might want to take note of that if you're at home right now, uh, and, and that's where he will be coming to you from today. And then also, at the end of the message, um, we will be partaking in communion. So if you're at home, uh, you might want to get some preparation for that ready. And if you're here, you hopefully got one of these little things, if you're a believer, to make sure you grab one of these so you can partake in communion at the end. And then next week, Pastor Ed is back, and he starts a new series called Deliver Us. And that will be for the next eight weeks. We're all excited about that. And I want to give you the opportunity to let you know, if you're not in a small group here at Living Faith, you can join something called a life group. And that will follow the sermon series for the next eight weeks. It'll be really cool. It helps you to uh, get connected with some people in the church, probably because of what's going on. It'll be uh, virtually through Zoom, so you can connect anywhere. You'll get to know some people in the church. It makes the big church feel a little bit smaller. And you'll follow along and unpack the sermon series a little bit more each week. And it's a great way to try it out. A small group is, is kind of for the year. This is just an eight-week commitment that you're going to make. So you can try it out. It's called the Life Group. Go online and click that you're interested in signing up for one. We'd be happy to get you plugged in to uh, a life group here at Living Faith. Well, we're going to continue in worship. But before we do that, would you just join me as I uh, pray for this service right now? Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you, that we, we thank you that we have the freedom to worship you, Lord God. You are truly our way maker. And that's not just lip service. You are the way maker. And Lord, I, I want to say at the start of 2021, would we all, myself included, because I sometimes get sucked into this and I try to do things on my own and I forget that you are the way maker, Lord. And, and, and I know for some of us, we try to plow through and we're just going to figure out a way and we have to do it on our own and we think that we know best sometimes Lord and forgive us for being idiots if I can just say it frankly that we think we know better than the God of the universe the one that created all and yet we think we have a better plan who are we forgive us help humble us Lord so we can let go and let you give it over to you stop trying to do everything on our own in 2021 that we're gonna give it over let you have your way in our life, that we are gonna, we're going to trust that you are God and that you are going to do what you need to do in us and that we can look back at the end of 2021 and say, thank you, God. Look at how much you've grown my faith and look at what you've done in my life because I've stopped trying to do it on my own and I've let you take control of my life. That's my prayer, Lord, that at the end of this year, I can look back and say that I know you better and closer, and I love you more, and I have more faith than I did at the start of this year, and that's my prayer for every one of us today. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for the privilege it is to get to worship you, and we ask it all in your name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship together.
God so loved the world. Amen. Well, hello there. I'm so glad to be with you today on this first Sunday of the year. Today I'm going to be speaking on finding love in our differences. Now, I'm going to read a poem to you this morning. I wasn't very good in English, math, social studies, science. I was good in phys, phys ed. That was, that was my course right there. But I want to read a poem to you this morning that I think um, some of you can relate to anyway. It's about finding love. And it, it says this, to live above with saints we love, oh, that will be glory, right? But to live below with saints we know, well, now that's another story. Living with others and loving them is never easy. So many things seem to separate us. You ever notice that? What, you say, let's go out to eat. And what happens right away? Three are saying, let's go here. Another two's there. And another one says, let's go there. Uh, work. We are separated at work. We have differences of opinion and, and uh, the way we do work, and so we're separated by that. Um, the things that sleep. Some of us get up early in the morning and say, hey, let's go somewhere, and you're going, I don't, not at 6 a.m. in the morning, and, and some of you are going, wait, wait till 10, and then, and then maybe, okay? Uh, others are, others are uh, wanting to do things at 9, 10, or wh whatever it is. We just, we have sleep habits that are different. And then interests. Uh, some of us love sports, and some of us love um, golf and, and other things like that. Uh, you can see I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, I guess you hit a ball down the course and just walk. If you like, go for a walk. You can do that. Yeah, family things. <laughs> How many people in your family are together on everything? They're always divided. Something separates us and keeps us apart. But in Christ's final night here on earth, John 17, he tells the story about that. And if you can turn your Bibles, if you'd like to, to John chapter 17, I'm going to refer to it. Uh, in his final night, he had a prayer. And that prayer, one of the key priorities was that, is that we live in unity and loving relationships, just as the Father and the Son were in a relationship together, one of unity. He wants us to have that same oneness that he had with the Father. So let's read in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23. If you've got a Bible at home, you can open it there. Follow along with us. In John chapter 17, beginning verse 20, says, My prayer, Jesus says, is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Christ was praying for unity, not for truth, justice, and the American way. And if you, you think back, and as I do, you think back, you rarely have heard messages about unity um, unless it was about unity among us. You know, just us four, just us six, just us 22, maybe just our small church, just the unity. So we'll, we'll talk about unity then. But man, if we have to have unity among all believers, now that's going to be difficult because we have differences of opinion on everything. I don't think I've ever heard a unity message that didn't hedge, though, in some way when I did hear a unity message. Um, you know, we, we, we hedge over church plans, right? You, your church gets together, we're going to plan this, and all of a sudden somebody says, well, what, what about this? Well, we don't want to, uh, we're not going to do that. See, we don't like interference. 
So we hedge over unity then. And we hedge over doctrinal integrity. By the way, we need doctrinal integrity. Um, the Bible starts with creation. God created all things. Why does it start that way? Because we have a, a source for all things. That's God who is behind it all. And then at the end of the book, what happens? Christ returns. So what do we have? We have the priority. We have both the source for our living and we have the priority for our living. But you know something? Sometimes we, well, but what about the way he returns? And what about the way it was created? And so we start to hedge over being unified in that. And then we hedge over a continuance of a program. How many times in a church we've looked and said, well, that program isn't that good at all. Let's just cut it. Oh, you try to do that? The end of the earth right there. All of a sudden, unity falls apart. And so we say, well, well, that's good enough. We'll, we'll just keep it going, even though it's not facilitating the priority, the return of Christ. We're strengthened by the source, the creator of all the universe. And then we hedge to protect peace, you know? Well, I, well, let's, let's, well wait a second. Okay, we, we won't do it then. We'll just have, so we, we hedge on unity and we center it around that peace and at and limited cost for us. Christ never hedge though. When he got upset, you remember the, the insensitive? He, he, he dealt with them, the Pharisees. They, they wanted to denounce, you know, no healing on the Sabbath. You can do it the other days of the week. Christ said, what are you talking about? And, and Christ got upset with those who didn't get it, the disciples. Well, Lord, should we stop them? They're healing in your name over there. We don't want that to happen, of course. Christ is going, what are you, nuts? The indifferent that you had 10 lepers who were healed and only one came back. What's with that? Aren't people appreciating things? The wicked, uh, Herod, who killed John and threatened others. Jesus spoke about that. The smug, we have the chief priests and, and, um, and all who attempted to discredit the Lord. Why? Because they wanted to be elevated. They didn't care about unity. They didn't care about coming together under that banner of love and concern and care. And those who twisted things. Then there were the lawyers, right? We had the lawyers out there, and they're coming to Jesus, and they're going to pose some questions to him to try and trick him and make him look like a fool or discredit him as well so they can go back to the chief priest and say, we did our job. But yet, Jesus did what, though? He quickly forgave a misguided crowd cursing him as he went on his way to the cross, and he forgave them. And he also dealt with a mocker on the cross too, didn't he? That mocker just sat there all morning long and then suddenly turns to him and he says, hey, uh, will you remember me when you go into your kingdom? Would you do that for the guy who's mocking you down? And then suddenly he asks, well, could you help me out at the end? But his prayer was based on his relationship to the Father all the way. It was about unity. The Trinity, it teaches us that God, the Father, is eternal. It also teaches us that God the Son proceeded forth from the Father for all eternity. And it teaches us that God the Spirit came forth both from the Father and the Son from all eternity. You'll notice there's one unique part, from all eternity. I don't understand everything in the Bible. I don't even begin to understand the Trinity because it's beyond my scope of understanding. But the fact is, is that they loved one another and promoted one another in unity fully. No matter what Christ went through, he didn't say, Father, you had a bad plan. They're putting a crown of thorns on my head. The Holy Spirit didn't say, hey, they're, they're, they got things in their life that are hindering my activity in their life. Jesus, you should have picked somebody else. He didn't say that. They worked together in unison. What God desires then is for us to love one another and to promote the gospel no matter what we face together, to find love even in our differences. I've got a couple of points that unity comes through here. Unity comes through staying in relationship with Christ. He says, abide with him in John chapter 15 and he will abide with us. Our strength is found in Christ, the person of Christ. Always, no matter what your conflict is in life, no matter what comes your way, think about Jesus and how he handled those things. As you tie in to what he taught, as you tie into how he lived it out, 
you'll find that you can live out love in unity. The second thing is, when unity comes, comes through identifying with the teachings of Christ. He must increase, John said, and I must decrease. Always elevate, what was it that Christ taught us? Let me live that way, not as I choose to live, not as I think I want to live. And you know something? Sometimes the way we live, even though it seems so right, may be wrong. That's hard to think about. I like to think that the, when something goes right, it was always from God. You know, you can, you can choose some things out there that may not be the best of what God wanted for you, but they're good things. But you miss out on the best. You miss out on that unifying love that Christ brings to us by choosing another way. And so we identify with the teachings of Christ. Number three, breaking any stronghold in our life. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, set aside things that will hinder us and stop us, the weights that will so easily beset us. Get rid of them in our lives. Unity comes when we empty ourselves and we draw upon all that Christ brings us. We find another way, and that way is the way of Christ. Number four, agreeing with one another on each movement. As God the Father and as God the Son function in unity together, that's the way we are to function. Agreeing with one another, that's how we're going to go. And that might mean we got to get rid of some things because the other person brings to the plate something that will help us to grow in the Lord, something that will draw us together. And we lean upon that. We lean upon the work of the Holy Spirit, in other words, on another person's life, not just in our own. Number five, not being concerned or jealous of another person. Remember Peter at the end in John chapter 21, uh, Peter was concerned with himself. He was jealous of John. He, he, uh, he had watched John as he leaned upon Jesus, you know, at the, at the Last Supper. And uh, no doubt, and Peter, you know, he liked to do his own thing, high D in that dispersonality, very dominating guy. And uh, Peter said uh, to Jesus, John 21, 20, 21, when Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about him? <laughs> it's always what about them? Really, what we want is, what he's saying is, what about me? What about me? How am I going to succeed? And Jesus said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Be single focused and upon me, what he's saying. Upon what God has taught you. What you're being instructed in. Upon what the Holy Spirit is guiding you to do. Don't be concerned about what somebody else is doing. And then number six, seeking the best for each other. Consider others, the Bible tells us, consider others more important than ourselves. In other words, we're fulfilling others' goals rather than our own. Philippians chapter 2, that's what Christ did. He came to earth, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And that's what the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit agreed to do. You know something? It wasn't in Christ's best interest to do that. That's for sure. Sometimes in order to win the war, you have to lose the battle. And you know something? That's where we get caught up sometimes. We're so animated about doing it our way, having it our way, because we, we see the world through our eyes and our eyes only. I mean, I don't have another set of eyes to look through. I have my own. And thus, when I see the world that way, I, I move forward only my way. It's hard to participate and help others fulfill their goals. But you know something? That's what Christ calls us to do, seeking the best for each other. Can I give you a, a sidebar? It's not my notes here. This week, why don't you look for a battle you can lose? That's right. Why don't you find something worthy of losing so that you can advance the gospel of Christ in showing how important Christ is in your life to somebody else. It's not just a bad idea. I'm going to try that this week. I'm going to try to lose a battle. I don't know where the battle's coming from. I don't know who, where the argument is going to be. But I'm going to look at somebody and I'm going to say, you know what, let's do it your way. <laughs> that's just not the way we want to do. But that's the way the Holy Spirit guides us to be sensitive to be loving, to be kind, to be good, to be true, to be honest, 
and full of integrity, recognizing that our relationships to one another are supposed to be like Jesus and the Father. And then finally, seeing this as an obedience thing, pleasing to Christ. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that you beseech your brethren by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world any longer, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and be well-pleasing and perfect will of God. You know, that's the way we're to live. And <laughs> that's how we're to find unity. It comes through those things. Seeing it as, as an obedience thing, pleasing to Christ. I, I want to obey. Why? Not because it's just a good thing to do in life. Not because I'll get ahead in life, but because it honors Christ who died for me. The passage of Scripture tells us that. He gave his life for us, his prayer, that we may be one. And why? Because he bought us. And that unity is found as we love one another, as the Father and the Son love one another. You know, it, it, it's just a difficult life that we face sometimes. And sometimes we just skip through it without recognizing that God's at work in our life. I remember I, I played basketball in high school. Um, I, I was in a small school on the coast of Maine, a boarding school. I, I went there by choice, okay, not because I had to go there. And um, while there, I played basketball on the varsity team, and, and I was one of the shorter players on the team. Gives you any idea how tall that team was. And I was a guard out there. And um, we, we got called upon once to play, a, play another team about 70 miles away. Now, that team had scarfed or taken three of our players um, it was a small Christian school. The, the students wanted to stay at home, so they were able to do that and then go to school there. Um, in the meantime, we were asked to play them. We played state schools all the time, but now we're going to play this little rinky drink Christian school with, you know, I don't even know if they had a full team of 10 players or not. All I knew, we were going to go to their court on their new gym, and we were going to play them. So we get there, and we're all standing around, and we're thinking, we're looking over at them, and we're saying, well, those are our guys, but... Uh, they're gone, and, and actually their tallest was shorter than me. So we thought, oh, this is going to be an easy game, right? We're going to go out there and trounce them. So we didn't play that well. We went out to the game, coach challenged us, we went out, broke huddle, and we used to have four quarters back then, 15 minutes I think each. And so we went out and we played for 15 minutes. Well, at the end of the 15 minutes, coach called us together because the score was 22 to 22 at the end of that quarter. Uh, coach was a little frustrated as he looked at us and I still remember him putting his finger in my face and then the other four players and he said the next time any of you goof up any of you don't work together as a team I'm taking you out of the game putting you on the end of the bench and working back through the bench now I don't know about you but I'm a starter the last thing I want to do is sit on the end of the bench and have to wait for my turn to come back in the game so we broke huddle we went out and did we play? We played so much differently. Man, we were just after the ball. We were passing the ball. We were shooting the ball right. We were, we were helping one another. And the score at the end of the game, because it changed the way we do things when we looked at things differently. The end of the score was this. Wayside, 32. Glencove, 122. <laughs> the game changed completely. We were working together, passed together. Didn't matter who shot the ball, didn't matter who scored the most points, because we just wanted to win that game. As believers, we must strive to be unified to win for Christ. But until we discover what drives us, we cannot overcome our sinful inclinations. <laughs> Years ago, a lady came to me. Uh, she struggled terribly in her marriage. My goodness, she was the godliest woman I ever met. Her, her husband was a godly man. Um, they had three great kids, and I thought, why, why does she keep coming to me about her marriage all the time? I mean, it was just one thing after another, after another. And I'm not a therapist. I'm not even a good counselor, probably, at all, in any form. And I know God's Word, and I'll share it with you, but that's probably as far as I can get with you. And um, she came to me and tired me out, actually. So I, I just, one day, I just looked at her, she was standing there, and she was rambling on, and I stopped her, and I said, so what drives you? Well, quite frankly, it just stopped her dead in her tracks. I never again heard an issue from her, but she didn't know what it was. Two years later, I got an email from her, and she said this. She said, Pastor Mark, I still am haunted 
by your question, what drives me? You see, what drives you determines how you're going to live life. If you expect to love people, you've got to understand it and understand what drives you. So you see, what drives you determines your ability to love. The first thing that drives us is family, doesn't it? Family drives us. Uh, whether your mom was a loving mom, your father was a loving dad, did your parents participate with you? Did they help you with your homework? Um, did, you, did you have a lot of brothers and sisters who ate all the food before you could get to it? Or did they share things? Did they share their toys? So there, there's a lot of things about family that determine how we're going to function and how we're going to, to love and our abilities. Another thing that determines that is our ethnicity. Now, uh, ethnicity comes into play pretty deep around here. This, this, this is New York City area. Uh, uh, ethnic groups are everywhere. I, I'm from a Dutch background. Um, and, the, and the Dutch, matter of fact, prior to my mom and dad being married, my dad was 100%, 100% Dutch in his background. They had never married outside the family. And so my family was Dutch, and the Dutch are hardworking people. And they, they like to work hard so that they can get... And they expect to get, um, and they're, fair, they're very generous people. Um, however, they're also very frugal people, okay? Now, some of you are saying it's another word for cheap, okay? I'm not saying I'm cheap. I'm frugal, okay? Because I'm Dutch. Uh, we used to have a saying uh, out in West Michigan when I lived there in seminary, if you ain't Dutch, you ain't much, okay? And um, we, we, we like the way we were. Our ethnicity drives us. Not only is our ethnicity, but our education. Some of us are well-educated. Some of us aren't so well-educated. And some of us, because they're well-educated, you look down on those who aren't so well-educated and think they can't think right. And those who are uneducated resent those who got to go to college, to, to a graduate school. Maybe they're a doctor, and they say, well, I could have done the same thing. And so there's a resentment, a bitterness. And the two groups uh, see the world differently, and they, it determines their ability to love. Another thing that drives our determination to love is our intellect. Our intellect. Some of us aren't so smart. And some people are really smart. I don't like to get around those people that are too smart. They, just, they seem to have a conversation that I, I'm not a part of. <laughs> They, they use uh, words that I still can't find on spell check, okay? You, you ever have spell check? You go to, you go to, you got a word, you can't spell it right in the middle of the sentence, and you're trying to correct that word. Spell check keeps saying, that's not the word, it's not the word, it's not the word. Finally, you just erase the word and start the sentence over with some other thought. Uh, intellect, and it, and it separates us because they don't think we can think right, and we, don't, we think they're too high and haughty and think too much of themselves. And then, and then our regions of the world, our regions in the, here in the United States separate us, and it, and it causes us to, an, an inability to love properly. I, I remember last week, uh, one of our staff members and I were discussing how regions come into play uh, in the way we respond to people. I'm not going to say how we'd respond to people here in New York all the time, but uh, he was down in the Atlanta area going to a conference, and he said he was on the highway, he needed to get off at the exit, and he just about missed the exit ramp, so he pulled in. You know, one of those, one of those people who pull in at the last second and want to cut that whole people, the line of people who have been waiting to get down the exit ramp. And he thought, oh boy, here I go, i got to shove my way in. You know, just like we would on the Cross Island Parkway or some other way. And, and as he went over, got next to the car, he put on his turn signal, and he said, the guy actually just waved me in. Couldn't believe it. The way we live in a region is going to reflect our ability to love other people, and then generations. In, in our generation, we, uh, you know, we think differently, we process differently, and it determines our ability to love, because if you're on the top end of this generation, you know, you're, you're one of the boomers or one of the builders above us, uh, you, you, you saw life a certain way, and then you come down to the millennials who say, you know, it's only 10 o'clock, I'll be there soon. And the, and the person who's Gen Z, who's on their phone says, well, why can't you know right now? Just Google it. It'll be there. And they're hardworking people because they expect it done now. They want to know why it's not done. And they're going to see life differently, and their ability to love is going to be affected 
by all of those things, by family, ethnicity, education, intellect, region that they come out of in generation. We're pelted, let me say it that way, we're pelted with differences. But in following Christ, we recognize we can overcome them through a unity found in love. You don't have to be mean, nasty, and tough. You don't have to disagree with everyone. You don't have to win the battle as well as attempting to win the war. You see, by following love, we find unity with the thought process and the understanding of God to express his beauty into the world we live around us. And we function better. We find and we experience love. That love is found in the love Christ had for us. So we go to John, 1 John. I want you to go there, 1 John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, let me read it for us. Beginning of verse 7 says this, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he... He loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen him and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. If the love we are to have is to be in Christ, the Christ-Father relationship, then how are we to love? I, I've got four expressions or four ways for us to understand. You can write these down. Number one, Christ is the foundation or source of our love. He loved us and he left heaven for us. This passage tells us he paid the price for our sins as God and the Savior. He cared for us that much. And in 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love him because why? He first loved us. He is the source of our love, the foundation of our love. You cannot love apart from that source because you'll always Go back to your own love that you try to express out of your depravity, and it just doesn't work. It only goes so far. Christ is the foundation and source of our love. Number two, Christ died to overcome our sin. We're horrible, that is, we're depraved, we're people who are sinners by nature, and yet we're forgiven. Christ died to overcome our sin. We must never forget how our sinfulness destroys and destroyed our ability to love, except through the Spirit of God. You take Cain and Abel. Cain comes with his offering. Abel comes with his offering in the book of Genesis. God receives Abel's, rejects Cain. Quite frankly, what the passage doesn't tell us is that it, it simply Cain could have said, I'm sorry, God, please forgive me. I'll do it right next time. And it would solve the problem. Instead, what happens? Cain becomes jealous of his brother Abel, and he kills him. God comes to him, and what's he say? Am I my brother's keeper? Our depravity blinds us to God, but love comes from God. He's the initiator of it, and he exemplifies it in everything that Christ did for us, and that's why we are called Christ followers, Christians, those who honor what Christ has done for us. Christ died to overcome our sins. Let us never forget that it cost Jesus greatly to pay for our sins. Number three, Christ commands us to love. We're, we are compelled as he gives the Spirit. He's given us of his Spirit, which enables us. Now, this is, this is important to draw upon because he says in John 16, 13 through 15, the Spirit will guide us in 
to all truth. And that's why we have to stay in tune with the Holy Spirit, drawing from Him. You can't seek your own. You can do a good, few good things. I mean, we're all made in the image of God. Even people who reject Jesus are made in the image of God, but they're fallen in deep need of a Savior. And when we come to the Savior, the Holy Spirit comes into our life to begin the process of transforming us and changing us into the Son's image and into all that He did for us. And so as we lean into the work of the Holy Spirit, God will begin to transform us. But we must honor Him and we must follow His commands to love. And we do that by leaning into the work of the Spirit. Number four, Christ's light is to shine through us. We're to reflect gratitude. You know, it, it, here in the passage, the Father has sent his Son, and we are to testify, that final verse, testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. We're to let our light so shine that men see the glory of God through us. May I say to you, it's possible. But if you're going to keep winning battles along the way rather than winning the war, you will never, ever be able to testify and give honor to the grace of God and that which has been parted to you. Lose some battles, folks, along the way. Give it up and allow God to work through you through a work of the Holy Spirit because that's what he wants and you will find great love. As we move to our time of communion, we then reflect upon just how unity and love work together. Communion reminds us of the work of Christ for us and how we must find love in our differences that will drive us to glorify him. Paul shows us that in his writing to the, to the Corinthians. Um, if we turn to the passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 22, here's what it says, because they were having a little problem there. There are all kinds of problems in that church. They weren't yield, leaning in or yielding to a work of the Spirit in their lives in any form or fashion. And here he addresses one of those problems in verse 17. Verse 17, he starts out through 22. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Wouldn't that be horrible to say about a church? In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Paul writes, verse 19, no doubt there have, have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it's not the Lord's supper you eat, for when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. The Corinthians forgot the love of Christ that brings them together as equals. They ate their food, discounting the value of their brothers in Christ, and they resented and thought they were better than the others. You know, there was slavery at the time, and so Christ, people would trust in Christ, and they would look down, well, the slaves are here. They shouldn't eat my food, should they? When they got together, not only the slaves, but how about the poor? How about that widow over there? What if that person was a Gentile and I'm a Jew, but we're all believers in Christ? Yeah, but do they deserve to eat my food? And so they would hoard their food, keep it in their family or amongst people like them, and there was disunity in the body of Christ here in this passage. And that's what Paul is speaking about. They were embracing the gospel, yet forgetting that the gospel brought people together as sinners in deep need of a Savior. No better no worse than anyone else. So as we approach communion today, we must realize that we can find love in our differences only when we understand the depth of our own forgiveness and Christ's work for us. As Christ said, to whom much is given, may I say this to you, to whom much is forgiven, much is expected. I have five things, five quick points to give you in conclusion. And they are this. If we're to be unified, if we're to find love in our differences and be unified in that in 2021, then five things have to happen. Number one, we have to realize the Holy Spirit's in us. Every time you say something poorly to someone, every time you don't do what's right, 
anything that's off from being a Christian, you're violating the Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit lives in you, and you can rely upon him to drive you to do what's right and to find love. Number two, as a follower of Christ, you are charged with love and unity. Man, that's, that's important. It wasn't just that maybe you can stumble into being loving and to caring and to be unified. We're called to be unified. We're called to come to business meetings and say, yeah, let's move forward with that for Jesus' sake. Or maybe we ought to consider this. Oh, he's got a good point. Let's move forward with it, though. The bottom line is we move forward for the glory of God in everything, and we don't pause and hesitate in anything. We function together in love because we care too much about that person to hold them back in their walk with Christ, in their day-to-day operations, in the church, out of the church, anywhere where they are. Number three, God can guide and will guide us as you seek his will. He says, call unto me in the Old Testament, call unto me and I'll show you great and mighty things that you don't know about. Remember, he's the almighty one, the uncreated one from all eternity who has all power in the whole universe to do anything. He can see all things, knows all things. And we can be guided by him as we seek his will. Number four, it's no longer you who live, (laughs) that verse, but Christ who liveth in me. In the life that I live now, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave his life for us. Hey, we've got to recognize that. It's no longer me. But how is Christ working out his glory in my life? Finally, may I say it this way, you are your brother's keeper. Let's pray together. Father, we are mindful that we are our brother's keeper. We are mindful that the Holy Spirit has changed us in so many ways. We're grateful for the grace of God. The Lord Jesus gave his life for us, and um, I'm not sure what else we can do except honor you. Father, I pray that in this, this week coming that maybe we would yield to some other believers, mostly just yield to you, that we wouldn't be concerned about winning battles and wars, that we'd be more concerned about loving others and working together in unity to reveal and to shine forth the glory of God. I pray that we might be the kind of people that recognize we are our brother's keeper. As a result of that, we are to be like the Father and the Son, working together hand in hand to glorify you and to love one another. We thank you for these things as we take communion. We give our hearts to you. We give our, our lives to you. And we ask you to take and reform us, constantly work in us to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.